welcome to the University of Guelph Arboretum. My name is Kitty and behind the camera there, that's Jenny. Hello. And we are the naturalist interns here at the Arboretum. Uh, if you are staying at home for right now and you are missing your weekly dose of nature fun, uh, you're in luck because we're gonna bring you on a walk with us through these grounds, these lovely grounds to look for some, uh, right now for this season, some signs of spring, which is pretty fantastic. Now, as the weather is warming up, one of my absolute favorite signs of spring are all the birds that are migrating back up home to Ontario. In fact, I see a couple of robins hang out on the lawn just right here, right next to us. Let's see if we can get a little closer to foraging on the ground right here. Really, really sneaky. Hello, friends. What a pretty bird you are. Looks like they're all looking for something delicious to eat. Worms, maybe. Delicious, delicious worms from the lawn, or maybe insects. You'll notice you can recognize the robin by their orange chest and belly, and they have a gray back. And also a lovely yellow pointy beak. And their behavior can be kind of uh, diagnostic as well. You'll all the time see them maybe running on the lawn, searching for things to eat. This guy's doing a good job. Demonstrating all the field marks we need for American Robin. That is awesome. All right, though, if you are using Robins as a science bang, they definitely can be a fantastic science bang. But they're also a little bit tricky because American Robins, just like those birds we were taking a look at, they actually stay in Ontario all year long, which is a little bit tricky. And for sure, a lot of them do migrate down south for the winter, uh, where it's a little bit warmer, there's a lot more food around for them to eat. But some of them will actually tough it out here uh, all through the winter in the ice and snow. And when they do that, we see them adopt all new behaviors for the winter. Because in the summertime, in the springtime, where it's a lot warmer, there's a lot more critters out and about for them to eat, they're going to be eating mostly insects. That's their favorite snack. But in the winter time, a lot of those insects are hiding underneath bark or underneath the leaf litter, hibernating the winter away, so they're not very available for food. These robins instead then, if they're tapping it out here in the winter, they're going to switch to a diet of mostly berries. And that's how they live here all winter long. But definitely in the springtime here in the Arboretum, we are seeing lots and lots more of them around. And now that the weather is warming up, we are seeing other migrating birds as well coming up again. Things like red-winged blackbirds and tundra swans. And in a couple of weeks, warblers will be coming back up again, which I'm very excited about. I love warblers. But if you don't see the bird, a lot of times you can be hearing a lot more bird song in the springtime as well. Take a listen and see what birds you might be able to hear in the background here. So I'm hearing lots and lots of different things. I don't know how well you guys can hear through the phone there, but I'm hearing things like uh, American goldfinch and black capped chigarees and nut hatches, lots and lots of different things. And birds singing their little hearts out is a fantastic sign of spring. You know what? Birds, they make noises for a lot of different reasons. One of the best reasons is uh, they might be calling if they're feeling threatened by a predator. They'll be calling to uh, warn their uh, bird mates or maybe to even chase that predator away. But especially in the springtime where uh, things are uh, getting ready to mate and have babies, birds are singing to establish a territory and also to help attract a mate. So that's why you're hearing a lot of these birds make a whole new set of noises. If we take the American Robin, for example, they have a fantastic song. It's really, really recognizable once you know what you're looking for. To me, it sounds a little bit like they're saying, cheer up, cheerly, cheerio. Cheer up, cheerily, cheerio. And let's see if you can't hear in the background quite that well. Let's see if I can play it on my phone for you here. So this is what the American Robin sounds like, their song. So it sounds like cheer up, cheerily, cheerio. 
That's pretty awesome. All right, that's the American Robin song. Another really familiar one that you might be hearing right around now will be that of the black cap chickadee. Uh, we are really familiar, a lot of us are really familiar with black cap chickadees uh, calling, and their call sounds like chickadee dee 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 dee. That's why they're called the black cap chickadee. Uh, but this is actually their alarm call. When they say chickadee dee 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 dee, they're actually being a little bit angry. They're trying to chase a predator away or maybe they're feeling a little bit more agitated. But in fact, when they're singing to help attract a mate, they have a very specific song. It sounds like cheeseburger. Let's see if I can play that on my phone for you guys today. And I hear lots of, lots of robins chattering behind me too, which is pretty fantastic. Lots and lots of bird songs. If you guys are able to get outside or maybe even listening through a window, see what you can listen and comment down below the video. See and tell us what you're listening near you. All right, let's see, black cap chickadee. So this is what the black cap chickadee song sounds like. Sounds like they're saying cheeseburger. All right. That's pretty fantastic. Now, now that we've gotten a good look at some birds and we've been able to listen to some bird songs, those are not the only sounds of springs out there. So let's go out and see what else we can find. Yeah, let's move on to the next spot. But for those of you who are wondering what we're using to play bird call, we're actually using a special app called the Sibley Bird Guide app. And it's a pretty awesome guide. It's like a portable field guide in your phone. You can use it to check up on species ID or listen to bird call, look at ranges and information like that. It's pretty awesome. The Sibley Bird Guide is my favorite field guide for North American birds. a fantastic sign of spring but we have some lovely early blooming flowers that we're always happy to see to signal the start of warmer weather as well uh, these are crocus flowers they are one of the earliest blooming flowers we have here and they are a lovely purple color and uh, i'm sure they smell really wonderful to insects as well these early blooming flowers are super fantastic for a lot of insects that are uh, recovering from the winter or coming out of hibernation so it's a great food source for them and they have all these lovely bright colors to attract them to the flower as well so they can gather a nectar and pollen from the flower and in the process they'll help pollinate the flowers as well so these are one of the earliest flowers we're gonna see and it's pretty fantastic to see them they are a lovely lovely flower over there we also see another flower here these bright yellow flowers they are called winter aconite and you can see they are already a fantastic food source for a lot of honeybees here the honeybees are working hard uh, to collect food to get ready for the coming season and these lovely lovely yellow flowers are uh, fantastic for them and not only honeybees but we also have a fly here as well over on this flower and on a couple of the other flowers most people associate bees uh, with pollinators. We have lots of pollinators though that aren't bees. We have things like wasps and flies and hummingbirds and moths and butterflies, all sorts of things. And if you take a really, really close look at these bees, you'll notice that as they're landing on the flower, collecting lots of delicious things to eat, they are covered head to toe in hairs. Honeybees are very, very hairy creatures. But that's really useful for them because that means when they land on a flower, they can be covered with pollen. And as they carry pollen from flower to flower, not only will they help pollinate the plants, but they're also going to be collecting food that they're going to bring back to the hive. They can actually use specialized structures on their legs to uh, comb all this pollen into a what we call pollen baskets on their hind legs so they can carry it back to the nest and pack it down inside their hive for food. 
So there they are, buzzing loudly and working hard. Emerging insects also another fantastic sign of spring. So I'm very, very excited to see that. Now, of course, we are right in front of Wild Goose Woods here at the Arboretum, which is one of the old growth forests that we have here. It's a lovely place, home to lots of different plants and animals, including some pretty fantastic ones like pileated woodpeckers even. Uh, but we can see, see some pretty fantastic, fantastic signs of spring over in those parts as well. And I think I'll pass it over to Jenny to tell you a little bit more about yeah, it. Yeah, why don't we actually have a little bit of a closer look at what's going on inside of Wild Goose Woods because we have a beautiful new boardwalk over in the Wild Goose Woods currently. And the first section is open up. The later section, it's kind of blocked off by science, but it's still under construction. But the first section is opened up and it's lovely there. So why don't we have a little walk down there and see what's going on. swimming around. It's pretty cute so why don't we have a nice look at him. Look at him go! What a pretty bird. Enjoying wild goose woods. Me too buddy, me too. Here's a couple more. Here's a hen with this male right over here. Yeah, so if you look around us in Wild Goose Woods right now, you might have noticed along with the ducks that it's just a little bit wet here right now. And that's because this little section is what we call a spring ephemeral pond. Um, and what a spring ephemeral pond is, it's exactly what it sounds like. So ephemeral means it's not here all the time. It's fleeting. It's only here for a little bit. So this is a pond that is only around seasonally. So spring and farm ponds, they usually are in things like forest landscapes where there's very poor drainage. So in the spring, as the snow melts and spring rains come, you get all this area being flooded. So now you have these little seasonal ponds. And this is a pretty awesome habitat for a lot of different animals. You know, being a seasonal pond, we don't have things like fish hanging around, which means there's less predators for a lot of things that are nesting in here. So usually in ponds like this, you get a lot of amphibians. Like uh, in here, we get spring peepers and wood frogs, and they'll come on in in the spring where everything's nice and wet, and they'll lay their egg masses in the water. And there's a lot of invertebrates that hang out here too, avoiding predators. So it's a pretty cool thing. You actually find with a lot of spring ephemeral ponds that the forest is a bit of an ancestral home for a large amphibian community. And in the spring, every year, they move on into this wet area, lay their eggs. If you're lucky in the springtime, you'll soon be able to hear them calling as well, yes. which is pretty cool. It's a good time right now, especially as things are warming up and everything's nice and wet, to come on down to spaces or habitats like this and maybe keep an ear out in the evening because then you can hear a lot of those spring peepers peeping away or other amphibians and things like that. Calling for a mate, it's not only the birds that are all excited this time of year. So this is probably one of my favorite types of habitats because it's so very cool. The trick is with ephemeral ponds, because they're seasonal and shallow, they are a pretty vulnerable habitat. They're really easy to develop. So it's definitely a space we want to be protecting. And you know, like any other big area, there are some big kind of big picture management things we can do to help protect a space like this. You know, for example, we could not develop it. We'll protect an area like this, leave it alone, make sure it's still available for all those animals to hang around, lay eggs and things like that. We can also make sure we're not using any fertilizers or pesticides anywhere near spaces like this because if that leaches into the water, that can be a big problem for really sensitive species that are around, you know, all those amphibians because they can absorb those chemicals through their skin and makes them pretty vulnerable. So that can help a lot. But you know what, there are some kind of things that even 
people taking a walk in in a space like this can do to help protect them and keep this space not lovely and healthy for all the animals and plants around. Um, for example, if you come have a look inside the water with me, you might notice that there's a ton of debris here. All that leaf litter, there's a bunch of twigs and fallen down logs. If you're like a really neat gardener, you may feel an urge to maybe clean it up. Maybe you think, oh, well, maybe if I clean up this habitat a little bit more, it may be better for the animals. But resist the urge because all that debris is actually really important for the animals that live in here. So if we clean up all the leaf litter, the twigs hanging around, that's a big problem for the frogs and amphibians that actually lay their egg masses attached to all that debris. So anything in the habitat we want to leave alone and we don't want to mess around with things too much. The ducks are having a party over there it looks like. <laughs> Look at them they're go. Very excited about the pond. <laughs> I don't blame them. And leaving leaf litter can apply to even your own lawns at home uh, because a lot of times throughout the winter a lot of things like insects and frogs and other small critters like that will overwinter in that leaf litter and if you clean it all up they'll have no space to overwinter or if you clean it before uh, everything thaws then you they won't get a chance to emerge in the springtime you won't get all these lovely wildlife coming to your yard either so leaving leaf litter can be a really really great way to keep some wildlife in your yard <laughs> look at those ducks having a good time oh so cute Another thing we can do to make sure we're helping protect space like this is not only do we not disturb all the debris and organic matter there, but you also want to make sure you're not bringing any things in. If people see a nice pond like this and release things like maybe fish in here, well that disrupts the whole food web that's kind of got balance going on here because now there's all these predators for all the amphibians and invertebrates that are hanging out here. So that's a big bit of a big problem. We don't want to introduce any foreign animals or critters in here because we don't want to disrupt the balance that we have going on in the ecosystem. And you know, one of the biggest, easiest things to do to help kind of protect spaceless or natural, any natural space at all, is what you guys are doing right now, you know? Going out or maybe staying in and learning more about spaces like this is so, so important. The more people that know about these habitats and animals, the more people that there are to appreciate them, I think the better off we'll be. So thank you guys so much for joining us today on our video and stay tuned for more.